Hello and welcome to the March IASB Update Podcast. My name is Claire Short and I am part of the communications team at the IFRS Foundation. Today I'm joined by Hans Hugevorst and Sue Lloyd, Chair and Vice Chair of the Board respectively. Before we turn our attention to the March Board meeting held on the 23rd and the 24th of the month, let's take a brief look at what was discussed at the supplementary board meeting that took place earlier in the month. Sue, what was the purpose of this meeting? So that meeting was held to discuss the board's proposals concerning IFRS 16, our leasing standard that we put out for comment in February. Um, and we proposed extending the application of the original practical expedient that we introduced into the standard last year that was designed to provide relief to lessees or accounting for rent concessions that are arising as a result of COVID-19. So we proposed extending that practical expedient by a year so that it would be available for reductions in lease payments that were due up until the end of June 2022. And so at that extra meeting at the beginning of March, the board approved that amendment. Thanks, Sue. And that amendment is due to be published by the end of March. Anyone who's interested can find all the relevant information on ifrs.org. Now let's turn our attention to the agenda for the regular board meeting. Topics discussed this month included updates to the board's work plan, the primary financial statements project, and the goodwill and impairment project. Sue, can you start us off with a summary of the discussions on the board's work plan? Sure. So this month marks one year since we first locked down in the UK. And as everyone knows, there's been lockdowns all around the world. And we've been making some adjustments to our consultation timelines as a result of the pandemic. And this month we agreed to adjust our timetables again for some of the projects which aren't so time critical. And we're doing this to really try to help our stakeholders to make sure that they're still able to engage with us, um, given that there's quite a high volume of current consultations that we've put out for our stakeholders to look at. So given the feedback we've had from stakeholders about extra time, we decided to extend the comment period for, for three of our projects. So we've already got an exposure draft out for comment on our project on regulatory assets and regulatory liabilities. And we extended the comment period on that by 30 days from 150 to 180 days. We set the comment period for the targeted standards level review of disclosure project, which is part of our disclosure initiative, so that the comment period is 210 days. And then lastly, we agreed that the comment period for the third agenda consultation would be extended from 120 days to give people about 180 days to comment. Thank you, Sue. In addition to these changes, the board decided on a 180 day comment period for the management commentary project to ensure that this deadline doesn't clash with the end of other comment periods around this time. The next topic under discussion was business combinations, disclosures, goodwill and impairment and that consultation. Hans, it's been a few months since this was on the agenda. Can you fill us in on the progress of the project and then yeah. after that take us through the developments on primary financial statements? Okay, um, well, so this is a very important and difficult project because there's a wide variety of opinions um, how to improve um, in accounting, especially around goodwill and, and impairment. So people might remember that in March last year, the board started consulting on its preliminary views concerning goodwill and impairment, among others. And we sought feedback on these views in a comment period that ended in December last year. And this was then the first time that we discussed the feedback that we heard and the staff provided a high level summary of these comments. And among the feedback we heard that respondents generally accepted the need for improving disclosure information about business combinations, but they uh, raised concerns over the cost and commercial sensitivity of providing such disclosures. And many respondents suggested that information on business combinations should be provided in management commentary and not so much in the notes to the financial statements. So that's something we will have to look at. And respondents were really divided, not unexpectedly, on the board's preliminary view to retain the impairment only approach and not reintroduce amortization. While many respondents were supportive, others advocated for a reintroduction of the amortization of goodwill, and we'll have to discuss that again. So we um, expect interesting conversations about this in the future. 
Let me now turn to the primary financial statements project, which seeks how to improve information is communicated in financial statements, focusing especially on the statement of profit or loss. In December and January, the staff presented a summary of the feedback that we have received thus far. And this month, we decided to go ahead with three of our proposals. And these are the requirements that we decided to proceed with. For companies to present an operating profit subtotal in the statement of profit or loss. In general, there was a lot of support for us to define an operating profit subtotal. And we also decided that to achieve comparability, we needed to stick with our approach to define operating profit by specifying what it excludes rather than directly defining what it includes, which proved to be near impossible. For companies, the second proposal that we will continue with is for companies to include information about management performance measures, so-called non-GAAP measures, in the financial statements. And we also decided to cautiously explore whether to expand the scope of management performance measures beyond uh, the income and expense subtotals. And I must say we were all very much pleasantly surprised by the support that these proposals have received thus far. And finally, the board decided to proceed with eliminating some presentation options in the statement of cash flows. And the board will continue to discuss the remaining proposals at a future meeting. Thank you, Hans. Sue, let's come back to you. The board was also asked to make a decision on the second comprehensive review of the IFRS for SME standard. Can you fill us in on what happened with this project? Sure. So as you might recall from last month's podcast, we're carrying out our second comprehensive review of the IFRS for SME standard, which the board originally issued in 2009 and amended in 2015. This month we decided to move the project from the research phase to the standard setting phase with the goal of aligning the SME standard to the full IFRS standards while balancing um, that alignment with keeping the SME standards simple enough for small and medium sized companies to apply. So as a result, we'll now start working towards developing a consultation document that will propose amendments to the SME standard for new requirements in the IFRS standards that are in the scope of this review. Thank you, Sue. Moving on to the next topic, Heinz, please fill us in on what the board heard regarding the equity method research project. Yes, so just to provide a little context, the equity method project was created in response to the many questions that had been raised about this topic with the interpretations committee. And the objective of the project is to reduce the need for narrow scope amendments to IAS 28. So the first step in a research project like this, according to our due process, is to identify the problem What is the problem exactly? And I must say the staff have done a wonderful job in drafting 22 application questions and collecting an additional 49 questions from stakeholders so that we really know what the problem is. And they are currently analyzing the questions according to five key criteria that include whether the application questions can be solved without amending other IFRS standards. And the final number of questions that will be addressed has not been determined yet, as some might simply be resolved and new questions may arise during this part of the research phase. So something to keep an eye on, because it is a question that troubles a lot of people in practice. Thank you, Hans. Those who are particularly interested in the Equity Method project can find and follow it under research projects on our current work plan on ifres.org. Uh, Sue, let's turn to a regular topic on the agenda. What did the board hear in terms of maintenance and consistent application this month? So the board got an update about what the Interpretations Committee discussed at their February meeting. And the committee recommended that the board consider undertaking a narrow scope standard setting project for our leasing standard, IFRS 16, this time one that's unrelated to the COVID amendment that I was talking about earlier, but this one is to do with sale and leaseback transactions and in particular a situation that arises when a company is sold. So there's the loss of control of a company and that company has a single asset in it and the asset is leased back to the seller. So it's a form of sale and leaseback transaction. Um, And so there's a recommendation to do some work there. 
In addition, the board heard about two other issues that were discussed by the committee. One was about how to determine the relevant costs considered necessary to sell inventories when measuring um, inventory. And the other was the preparation of financial statements when an entity is no longer a going concern. So in both cases, the Interpretations Committee has reached an initial uh, decision not to pursue standard setting. And the tentative agenda decisions that um, include that recommendation are currently out for public comment until the middle of April. Thank you, Sue. Uh, that wraps up the discussions from the March meeting, but it's also been a busy month in terms of published materials. The annual taxonomy went live on the 24th of March and a few consultations have been opened for comment. Among these are an exposure draft for the disclosure initiative, specifically on the topic of targeted standards level review of disclosures, as well as the board's third consultation. Sue and Hans, could you tell us a little bit more about these two consultations? Sure. So firstly, on the targeted standards level review of disclosures. So we published the exposure draft this week and it's out for comment until late October this year. And it's a little bit of an unusual exposure draft. It's really got two main components. One is setting out a new approach to drafting disclosure requirements where the board initially spends more time with investors to understand their information needs and uses that to draft disclosure requirements that are focused on satisfying particular objectives to do with user information needs. The hope is that that type of drafting would encourage better application of materiality and judgment and result in more effective disclosures being included in financial statements. So that's one part of the exposure draft. The other part of the exposure draft is then illustrating what that approach would mean by proposing amendments to the drafting of the disclosure requirements for two of our existing standards, IFRS 13, the Fair Value Measurement Standard, and IES 19, the Employees Benefits Standard. This is a really important consultation because we're often told that our disclosure in financial statements is not very effective, and so we really need input from people about whether this approach would assist them and providing better disclosure and also on the enforceability of this approach to drafting. So please do send us your comments. Then perhaps uh, let me say a little bit about the uh, agenda consultation we discussed before, but just a short uh, summary. Uh, agenda consultation helps us create our new five year plan. So that will be largely for my uh, successor, Andreas Barkov. We are asking for views on the strategic direction and balance of our uh, activities. For example, how much time should be spent on developing new IFRS standards compared with the time that we should spend on our other activities, such as supporting consistent application of the standards. It's an important opportunity to help shape the board's priorities and the future of financial reporting. So I should encourage everybody with an interest in financial reporting to share their views with the board. Thank you. Before we wrap up, listeners may also be interested to know that the IFRS Foundation trustees are moving forward with the work they're doing on sustainability reporting. Over the past few weeks, they've made some important announcements on a potential new sustainability reporting standards board, as well as the strategic direction it could take. If you're interested in this piece of work, visit ifrs.org forward slash sustainability. And that brings us to the end of another podcast. Thank you, Hans, and thank you, Sue, for joining me today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. You can find all past episodes of this and other podcasts on our website, on YouTube, on Spotify, and on your podcast player. If you have any comments or suggestions for the podcast itself, please email me on communications at ifrs.org. Until next time, keep well.